Thank you again, Commissioner, for sharing this lunch with us, sharing the day with us, and outlining the shared work ahead and your optimism for New York's will to continue leading. Uh, I'm going to welcome up panel four now. We'll start the afternoon of panels. Uh, we have as our first moderator, Rachel Lieberitz from right here at SUNY ESF. Uh, she will be leading our first panel on this afternoon on sustainability and the built environment. So if the panelists want to make their way up to the table, thank you so much. Good afternoon. Sorry to get started. I think it's about time. So, um, really pleased to be able to kick off this afternoon's session. Um, we have a really great panel, um, quite diverse set of expertise. We have municipal leaders, we have scholars and educators, we have advocates um, and practitioners, um, really ready to share their. Uh, uh, expertise with you. So our panel deals with the built environment, um, featuring the intersection of experts from across academia, policy, and practice, whose work considers sustainability in the built environment, both with respect to preservation and reuse, which is very important to me, and with respect to how we can better address the impacts of new projects and materials. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have our first presentation is really a group of three, a group of three. Um, and uh, those speakers are Andrew Robley, who is the president of Robley Historic Preservation, and also the president of PACNI, that is the Preservation Association of Central New York. And I happen to be a board member of PACNI as well. I encourage you all to join if you are here in central New York. Um, we also have Jennifer Minner, who is an associate professor of uh, city and regional planning at Cornell University. She is also the director of graduate studies there and also um, the director of the Just Places Lab. And then rounding out that panel, we have uh, Gretchen Worth, who is the director of the Susan Christofferson Center uh, for Community Planning. And so I'd like to start, I think, Andrew, you are first, is that correct? All right. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everybody. Um, as Rachel mentioned, my name is Andrew Robley. I'm the president of the Preservation Association of Central New York. We are a historic preservation advocacy group, and we cover Cayuga, Cortland, Madison, Onondaga, and Oswego counties. Um, within our service area, we have about three quarters of a million people, um, 10 <laughs> National Historic Landmarks, uh, 430 or so National Register listed properties and thousands of other historically and culturally significant properties. Uh, I'm going to provide a brief introduction to historic preservation for you um, and tie it to sustainability and the environmental movement in order to set the stage for the subsequent discussion. So I'm going to assume no prior knowledge uh, on the part of all of you. So if this is uh, old hat for some of you, if you're preservation experts, I apologize. So the demolition of Penn Station in 1963 was an important moment in the development of our national historic preservation movement. This uh, amazing piece of architecture and engineering was designed by the famous McKim, Mead, and White firm in 1910. Um, but by the 1950s, railroads were going out of use as the automobile became popular. By the early 1960s, urban renewal programs were at their high watermarks all over the United States. And New York City was no exception. In the face of a changing economy and to capitalize on a new structure, the owners of Penn Station resolved to demolish the structure. 
while public sentiment was uh, clearly against the demolition, groups organized too late to save the structure and it was torn down to make way for Madison Square Garden. After the loss of Penn Station, preservation took a few big leaps forward. The New York City Landmark Commission was formed in 1965. In the following year, President Johnson um, signed the National Historic Preservation Act, which he's doing here. Uh, this established the National Register of Historic Places that you may or may not be familiar with, and a set of policies for historic properties that continues to grow and evolve. Moving on a few years. Uh, this is massive. I'm used to this on my computer this big. Um, a catastrophic oil spill in early 1969 off the coast of Santa Barbara released about 3 million gallons of crude oil from a, a drilling platform and led to the creation of Environmental Rights Day the following year as a reaction. Um, this new environmental consciousness was focused on protecting the environment against not just pollution, chemical pollution, uh, but also large-scale demolition and destruction. By 1972, the movement was involved in a successful protest of the Crosstown Expressway in Chicago, um, which, in which the movement related the destructive freeway projects of the previous decade with waste and pollution. The effect of the 1973 to 1974 Arab oil embargo brought home to the great majority of average Americans the true vulnerability of our natural resources and the limits of our consumption. Preservationists and environmentalists seized on the events to promote the advantages of preserving existing buildings and rehabilitating historic properties. Um, coincidentally, or it's no coincidence, rather, that the first version of the federal, the first revision of the federal tax code to include, um, to favor historic preservation was in 1976, when the effects of this embargo were still fresh. Uh, this was a prelude to the 1981 establishment of the Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit. In addition to prov providing financial incentive for preservation, the oil crisis triggered a long and ongoing scientific dive into the quantification of energy efficiency in buildings. The demolition of existing buildings contributes to the overloading of our already maxed out landfill and garbage infrastructure. An emerging concept finding some traction with preservationists is deconstruction, which you will hear more about. This expands the understanding of where preservation, quote unquote, ends. It envisions that as a last resort, building materials can at the very least be reused and saved even if they are not constituted as they originally were uh, as a historic building. It envisions, um, excuse me, take the example of this church here. This is the uh, National Register listed Wall Street Church in Auburn, New York. This building was vacant for about 20 years um, and despite the effort, efforts of Packney and local planners to save the building, um, the local fire chief last summer finally declared it unsafe and the building was demolished. Crowd, um, the, the, the organization that you're going to hear a little bit more about later, um, we stepped, I'm also a member of Crowd, um, we stepped in to try and salvage the building materials since um, the, the fire chief's order precluded any injunction against saving the building and stopping demolition. Uh, we tried to salvage the building materials for an experimental sustainable community in Tompkins County, but that effort failed. In the end, once the demolition contract is signed, all of the materials above ground belong to the demolition contractor. And in this case, the contractor uh, did not communicate with us, so there was no saving those materials. The reclamation of building materials can still benefit the environment. Um, reclaimed and salvaged materials are often a higher quality uh, than new materials. It's likely the wood used to build your favorite historic property down the street, wherever you live, uh, was grown and felled not far from the structure itself. 
It has acclimatized to the drastic changes in weather in upstate New York, although as these become more drastic, there will be new issues that emerge. Um, but that's not so with lumber used in new construction, which was likely chopped down in a factory forest somewhere far, far away. Um, and treated with all sorts of chemicals, um, which to a large degree nowadays classify them as um, non-exempt materials, which means even the lumber, even the studs used to build a new house have to be disposed of as if they were asbestos, which is another non-exempt material. This is the chemical formula for gypsum, which is the main ingredient in plaster and drywall. And I put this up here just to give you a couple examples of um, how these materials can be reused. It's estimated that over 30 billion square feet of gypsum wallboard, two minutes, oh dear. There's a lot of gypsum that's made. Um, so for, for many years, for hundreds of years, gypsum has actually been used as a fertilizer. Um, there's natural chemical properties that cause it to react with highly acidic soil, um, and, and, and uh, it's posit results in positive uh, yield increases for certain crops. Um, so I put this up here just to talk a little bit about gypsum and how there's so much gypsum that's taken down with a demolished building. You know, it's been 60 some odd years since drywall became prevalent and it's everywhere. We're gonna move a little bit faster here. Um, special attention in recent years has been paid to steel reinforced concrete. Um, one of the worst problems is with the, the chemical reaction between the rebar and the concrete. When rebar corrodes, it expands. And so it, um, it takes up a greater area than it originally did, and that leads to the failure of a lot of our bridges, especially up here in New York. This is around Fort Drum. This bridge was built only in 1994. Um, concrete production accounts for five or as high, to, as high as 9% of all the world's carbon emissions, so its preservation is very important. So I'm gonna wrap it up now. Um, it's estimated that buildings, existing buildings, consume 40% of America's energy. And America, America consumes about a quarter of the entire world's energy. Hence the expression popular among preservationists that the greenest building is the one that's already built. Caring for the character, condition, and treatment of the world around us relates not just to the actual maintenance of a historic building, but also the treatment of our natural world. And that includes historic and cultural landscapes as well. So studying the interlocking relationships between energy use, construction, the economy, and the environment are key to creating a sustainable world. Historic preservation has to be viewed as an important dimension in the study of sustainability. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm Jenny Minner. I'm uh, an associate professor at Cornell University in the Department of City and Regional Planning, and I direct the Just Places Lab. And I'm also a proud founding uh, uh, partner of Crowd, and I'm going to talk about Crowd uh, and the connection between um, its work and the idea of working towards uh, the care, socially just care of places. Um, so. A centerpiece of what the students in my lab have, has, have been working on is uh, contributing to CROWD. And CROWD stands for Circularity, Reuse, and Zero Waste Development. It began in 2020 as a network to work toward a more sustainable built environment around New York State. I've highlighted preservationists because I want to make that connection uh, between preservation leadership and sustainability, but also uh, is composed of planners, architects, salvage and reuse professionals, university labs, and, and many more. Um, it's a growing movement to support building and building material re reuse, recognizing uh, the environmental, cultural, and economic value of deconstruction. So some of you may have heard about um, the city of Ithaca's Green New Deal resolution. 
um, and its decarbonization um, actions. It, in 2019, uh, it adopted a resolution to achieve carbon neutrality community-wide by 2030 and to ensure that benefits are shared among all local communities to reduce historical, social, and economic inequities. Um, and many of its efforts have focused around building energy retrofits and electrification. So that's really in motion. Um, but Crowd really organized to bring forward the idea of building and building material reuse as offering important additional means toward decarbonization towards reducing waste and the public health impacts of demolitions and creating new jobs. Um, it came out of the uh, observations within Ithaca's own college town of the rate of demolition. Um, the image here you see is of the demolition of the Chicona block, which is, um, was recommended by Historic Ithaca to be a landmark. Uh, and the Ithaca Landmarks Commission. Unfortunately, it did not become a landmark. And significant elements, which is the salvage wing of historic Ithaca, uh, began salvaging uh, Chicona Block. I, as a researcher, tagged along, as did Gretchen Wirth, um, who will speak after me. Um, and we began to organize around uh, bringing awareness of the potential for deconstruction and salvage uh, to work towards building a circular economy uh, within Ithaca, within the region, and New York State. So we've been working toward resource uh, and resource development and research, community education, policy and practice, and green jobs and skills creation in a variety of ways. Um, and so I want to highlight again and emphasize what Andy was saying about preservation um, having a, an important role in conserving embodied carbon, the carbon that goes into um, the extraction, uh, the movement of material, the construction of buildings. Um, and if we can preserve them in, in place, we can preserve the embodied carbon uh, and embodied history uh, within the built environment. And when, but preservation isn't always possible. Um, we do need new construction as well, and I know that as a planner. Um, so when preservation is not possible, deconstruction and building material reuse is better than demolition alone. So what I'm highlighting here is the difference between demolition, uh, which is business as usual, and deconstruction and reuse in new construction. So Andy spoke a bit about um, the Wall Street AME Zion Church, uh, a really important uh, part of uh, Auburn's um, black history. And uh, he also alluded to a potential receiving site for these materials that would be materially and symbolically a really beautiful flow of material um, to a program that provides access to local farmland for local families, especially of African and indigenous ancestry, as well as refugee families who have been historically displaced from land. So the idea was to move materials from the church to this other receiving site. It didn't happen, but all is not lost. This can uh, be a part of the narrative uh, in other places. So I wanna show a film clip here, and I'm not hearing the sound. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it. Is there any way to turn up the sound on the... The built environment is one of the key players in climate change. Buildings are responsible for 40% of carbon emissions globally. 
Um, and so we have to change. This is not a question. The question is how do we change and how quickly can we change? That, that really is the question. I'm really into trees and to save this um, beautiful 100 year old oak, this chestnut, eight inch wide chestnut boards that are 12 feet long with gorgeous green. I mean, it's something you can't even get anymore. Beautiful fir, the structural lumber that was in these houses is, uh, you know, I think invaluable in a sense. If we tear down a building in one, two days, just putting it all in a dumpster and carrying it to the landfill, that is cheaper in terms of how many labor hours you put in and what kind of equipment you need, but we carry societal costs that result in climate change at the end. So you'll have to watch the rest of that video online. Um, but those are a couple of additional crowd partners. Felix Heisel, who is in the architecture department, and directs the Circular Construction Lab, and Diane Cohen, uh, who is very well known uh, in reuse circles, the director of Finger Lakes Reuse, speaking to how deconstruction can really be used to transform um, what is now a linear e economy in which we extract materials, make the built environment, but then throw away those resources in a relatively uh, quick pattern in many cases, um, and moving towards a circular economy uh, where we preserve buildings and then we design for uh, deconstruction and reuse. Um, so it becomes uh, a more sustainable system. So uh, in Crowd, we've been working toward um, exhibitions that uh, show deconstruct demolition in essence and uh, share the community benefits of um, alternatives in the form of salvage and deconstruction. This is a recent uh, exhibition that is coming down soon at the Tompkins Center for History and Culture. Um, and uh, Gretchen speaking at uh, one of our community workshops. This is a student from our lab who is sharing the amazing work that is being done in other municipalities around the country who are adopting deconstruction ordinances and incentive programs. Uh, and that includes, in fact, just yesterday, the city of San Antonio who adopted a deconstruction ordinance. Um, and here we are meeting with building department officials who are um, very excitedly, I hope, on board with the city of Ithaca moving forward. Um, we've been studying demolition activities and spatial patterns, um, and uh, we're presenting recommendations to support deconstruction and salvage um, to the city of Ithaca, um, really working toward a circular economy um, that includes deconstruction and material reuse. And instead of sad endings, we hope to build new alliances that can work towards sustainable beginnings. So thank you. And I'd like to turn things over to Gretchen Wirth, who will be speaking about taking this statewide. Hi everyone, my name is Gretchen Worth. I am the director of the Susan Christofferson Center. Um, we work statewide to support municipalities in their efforts to achieve a more equitable, climate resilient built environment. We're also one of the proud founding partners of Crowd, which as Jenny mentioned, circularity, reuse, zero waste development, and advocating and working toward a transformation locally, statewide, all over the world, from a linear construction economy to a circular construction economy. Um, the photo in the top right, I just want to call your attention to that, for those of you who may not recognize that, that's the Candida building on the Georgia Tech campus. If you haven't heard of this building, check it out. But in the new construction of this building, there was significant use of material that had been um, deconstructed, reclaimed. And so it's an amazing building for those of you interested in this sort of thing, but showing an end, not an end use, but a now a new use for old building materials. 
So there are a lot of benefits to a circular economy of any kind. I want to pull out some benefits that are specific to circular construction economy. So environmentally, Jenny mentioned in terms of the embodied carbon in all of these materials from their extraction, their processing, their transportation, when they went into building the new, the new site, the new building. Um, deconstruction from an environmental perspective obviously reduces the waste that we're sending to landfills. We're not sending all of that building material to die a bad death. Also, deconstruction when it comes to hazardous materials is far safer than even the safest demolition in terms of particles that are going into the air, into our water systems, into our soil. Culturally, socially, we are able when something has to come down for whatever reason to continue though to celebrate, to honor the craftsmanship, the history, the skills, the ingenuity that went into the creation of those sites and buildings initially. Um, there's also the case that is made that as we get better at adaptively reusing our buildings for additional purposes than what they were originally built for, as we get better at taking buildings apart and putting them back together again in a different format with old materials, that can also help foster new, more sustainable um, manufacturing and design practices going forward for our built environment. Economically, there's, there's many, many benefits to a local economy. Um, we're lowering the cost of maintaining landfills, certainly. But also, we're, we're developing jobs. And deconstruction is a job multiplier. So in a demolition site, you have a person driving a big machine, and then it's all carted off to a landfill. In deconstruction, there's certainly work that happens on site, but then there's transportation locally to retain those materials at a warehouse. There's the sorting, the processing, then the retailing and moving those back into the marketplace. Um, also, for those of you who do, um, who, who are in this sector already or who have been engaged in DIY jobs over the past couple of years, you know that building materials are at an all-time high in terms of cost. You also know that because of supply chain issues and others, they are in short supply. And yet every day we are sending to landfills beautiful, exquisite, extraordinary material that looks like that 1918 piece of old growth wood. And so we are throwing away everyday materials that could be augmenting what is currently a very scarce supply and what is an expensive supply. And so through crowd at a big level in New York State, we're really trying to elevate awareness and um, resources and support for what is an, a huge, enormous waste stream that I'm going to get to in just a minute. So New York State, as we all know, has, is considered a climate leader in a lot of different ways. And certainly in our waste streams, um, we are all very aware of single-use plastics. We don't get plastic bags at our supermarkets anymore. There's growing awareness around single-use plastics like water bottles, which I don't see today, which is fabulous, um, around our food packaging, around our takeout containers. And there are many, many programs. There are many resources. There's a lot of support around that particular waste stream. Similarly, our food waste stream. Over the past years, there's been tremendous, um, tremendous action, both at a local level, encouraging composting, making that easier for us in our different communities, and at an industrial level th with our dairy industry, with our craft brewing industry. And so we're really using, coming up with ways to use these byproducts to their highest and best use. We want the same thing to happen with the building materials that are all over every community, everywhere. And so these are the statistics, and they're horrifying. Building waste, CDD, construction and demolition debris, is our largest waste stream by far in this country and around the world. So we generate building waste, 600 million tons every year, twice the amount of the next largest waste stream, which is the everyday garbage we throw away. So it's, our building waste is twice the amount of our everyday garbage. As a result, it's the largest component of our landfills, most of it's coming from demolition, even though it's estimated that upwards of 80% of buildings and infrastructure could be reused if they were deconstructed and, and put back into the market. Um, th there's a lot of asphalt and, and concrete in this waste stream. There's also tonnages of wood, of brick, architectural salvage, other reusable materials. 
And as far as we know, and correct me if I'm wrong if you're in the audience, there is no local government in the state currently that has adopted a deconstruction ordinance or a building waste diversion requirement. Um, so there are some challenges which you probably would realize very quickly. Right now, demolition is cheaper and faster than deconstruction. We lack meaningful material outlets where we can store, process, re rehouse, and then rehome these materials. We lack policy, certainly, and we lack a significant and consistent workforce that is able to participate in this work. And so these are all challenges that we face right now in New York State. But there are plenty of local municipalities all over this country that have that have embraced deconstruction as um, business as usual rather than demolition. And so Portland, Oregon is considered the leader in deconstruction policy. They passed an ordinance in 2016 that required deconstruction of residences and historic properties built before 1916. Four years later, they expanded that to include properties built by before 1940. Palo Alto in California took a different tack. If a, if, a, if a site is coming down entirely, it has to be deconstructed rather than demolished. And they don't care whether it's commercial, residential, how old it is, what the building materials are, the size of it. You have to deconstruct if it's coming down fully. And also, um, although I know we're all proud New Yorkers and proud of our climate action, California is the only state in the country with a building waste diversion requirement. Um, Pittsburgh, about a year and a half ago, the mayor signed an executive order that required deconstruction for municipal-owned properties that would normally be um, demolished and then set up a multi-stakeholder deconstruction action council. And then as Jenny mentioned, breaking news, just yesterday San Antonio passed their deconstruction ordinance by a vote of 10 to 1, um, and so they will be embarking on deconstruction after many years of a lot of community engagement, research, and, and action around that. Um, so crowd, we were working both locally with different municipalities as well as at a state level. There is so much work that we're doing, um, and so I'm just going to mention a few things um, perhaps relevant to this audience. We do a lot of outreach to our elected officials, to our state agencies, to organizations, to, as I've mentioned, raise awareness, advocate for funding and resources. We'd like to see state passage of waste diversion and deconstruction bills. We want this to include equitable green jobs, workforce development, and to fund these, these warehouses, these reuse centers that are necessary as part of the circular economy. Um, we are also working on a higher education deconstruction pledge for those of you here from academia so that if your campus is doing building and facilities work, we would like that to be deconstructed and building materials reused rather than demolition. And there's a whole list of other things that we're doing. Um, you can go on to our website, crowd.org, and I would just point to this deconstruction guide for local government, which we just published earlier this week. And so these are, it's a, it's a fantastic, easily accessible guide that you can download if your municipality, your organization is interested to learn more about how you can participate in deconstruction and start to help us to create a circular building economy in New York State and in your communities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to uh, Gretchen and to Jenny and to uh, Andy, and now I'd like to go to our second uh, group, a pair, um, and we'll be looking at the built environment in terms of selection of new materials, um, uh, sustainable building materials in public construction products, a case study of the village of Hastings-on-Hudson, New York, and our first speaker, Matthew Adams from the New Jersey Institute of Technology and also a fellow of the Rockefeller Institute of Government. And he will be followed by the Honorable uh, uh, Nicola Armacost, the mayor of uh, Hastings-on-Hudson. So thank you very much. Uh, here we go, Matt. Uh, great, thank you for having me. Um, wait for my slide to come up for a second. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna lead off this talk with a little bit of technical information on uh, the embodied carbon of concrete, where it comes from, why it's important. Um, that's what I am at heart, is a uh, concrete scientist. 
is it? Oh, after me. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm a concrete scientist at heart, that's what I do, and I've recently uh, forayed into the world of policy uh, to look at how we can move our new technologies out into the field. Um, so building materials account for about 11% of global CO2 emissions, uh, and concrete alone is responsible for 8% of global CO2 emissions. So it is one of the uh, largest uh, polluters in terms of CO2 emissions in the world. Uh, as a sole material, uh, and the majority of those emissions come from the production of cement, which is a key component of concrete. So what is concrete really? Well, concrete is like a cookie, right? You have your, uh, in your chocolate chip cookie, you've got eggs, flour, and butter, sugar and chocolate chips, and then some additives. Well, those egg, flour, and butter, those are your glue or your binder. Your sugar and chocolate chips are your filler and flavor, and then you've got your modifiers with your baking powder, baking soda, and salt. Concrete has the same sort of elements. Cement and water are our binder. Uh, sand and gravel fill up most of the space that is bound together by that cement and water. And then we have lots of different chemicals that we can mix into the system to modify uh, the properties of that concrete. And like a cookie, you can have a very basic chocolate chip cookie, or you can have a lot of variety of cookies. Concrete is the same way. There isn't just one formula for making concrete. There are endless, infinite formulas, and some of them are more environmentally friendly than others. Some of them are more sustainable than others. And so at its basis, basic though, concrete is made up of uh, air, cement, water and aggregates with, of course, the aggregates making up the majority of the volume and the weight of the system. But the key component there is really the cement that is causing us uh, concern in terms of CO2 emissions. And the reason for that is that CO2, or concrete is produced at a massive scale. At a per unit basis, it is actually one of the lowest embodied carbon building materials out there, much lower than, say, steel. Uh, but we produce so much of it per year, almost two cubic yards per person in the world per year, that is um, more than enough to fill, completely fill 11 Empire State Buildings, um, that it far outstrips these other materials in terms of CO2 release. And so where does that come from? Well, we make cement in a kiln like this, where we heat up ground up limestone and clay up to about 1400 degrees Celsius. Um, we use fossil fuels typically, though there are um, other waste materials that are being used as fuels to heat that up. That, of course, releases some CO2. Uh, but the majority of the CO2 is coming from this uh, process called calcination, in which we break down limestone. Limestone is CaCO3, or calcium carbonate. And when you apply enough heat to that, it breaks down into calcium oxide and CO2. Calcium oxide is what we want in the cement. That's what mixes with water to bind the system together. And that CO2 gets released out of the kiln into the air. There are technologies working on capturing that, uh, but it is, they're not there yet. And if once they are there, they're going to be extremely expensive to implement. So trying to just capture that is not uh, really uh, a solution long term. So how else can we reduce this embodied carbon of concrete, give ourselves more green concrete? What we really want to focus on is our hydraulic cement. Reduce the amount of hydraulic cement that we're using and use other materials that can help to uh, bind that system together but have lower embodied carbons. carbon. Um, one option is to just grind up limestone. Uh, you can only use a little bit of this, but it works to reduce the amount of cement. The most popular options right now are what are called supplementary cementitious materials. These include things like fly ash, which is uh, waste from coal burning, slag, which is waste from steel making, and silica fume, which is a waste from uh, computer chip making. Of course, these are all waste products from other dirty industries. So they're starting to be phased out and harder to get. 
Um, and so even though they're beneficial use, we don't want to use them as much as uh, we have been. So we have newer materials that are less impactful. Um, calcined clay, which is just clay that's been heated up, so not as high as of a temperature as cement, um, doesn't release CO2 from a chemical reaction. And locally, ground glass pozzolan is something that's very interesting because um, this is produced from waste glass, which most of you are probably familiar with the fact that glass that gets sent to be recycled often doesn't actually get recycled. It just gets held in a big storage pile because there's no circular market for it. Well, there's a company in Western Connecticut that's currently taking waste glass from upstate New York, crushing it down into a powder, and um, using that as part of the cement. So you can see on the bottom picture there, that is the ground glass powder. It doesn't matter what color your glass is, when you grind it fine enough, it all becomes uh, that white powder, and that's all produced from this waste glass material. And you can see this really is waste glass. There's a uh, Heineken bottle cap up there on the top right. And this, um, <clears throat> amazingly, is comparable, comparable in cost to cement and those other supplementary cementitious materials. So this is really um, starting to go out there. And I'm setting the stage for these materials because uh, Mayor Armacost is gonna talk about how they're utilizing them in uh, Hastings, on, Hastings on Hudson. Another option that is gaining traction is incorporating carbon dioxide into your mixture where you actually um, cure the concrete or mix car frozen carbon dioxide directly into your concrete. This actually doesn't use up that much carbon dioxide. People often think of it as, oh, I'm sequestering CO2. But you're actually putting very little carbon dioxide into it. But because you put that in there, um, it, there goes the chemical reaction. I'm not going to subject you to. But it increases the strength and allows you to reduce your cement content by 10 to 20%. Uh, but this requires very specific technologies. They haven't been widely rolled out. Um, so there's really limited availability of this. And it's questionable if those are going to uh, expand further than they already have. So what's stopping us from using these solutions? There are a lot more solutions I didn't get into because of time. But there's a lot of uh, barriers to sort of implementing these. First, there is always a fear of cost. Most of the work that uses concrete is public projects. We have a duty to uh, keep the cost down on those, not go with options that increase the cost of the product. Though, in reality, most of our solutions have comparable costs, as long as you're working with contractors that know what they're doing. The cost comes when you have a new material that a contractor doesn't know how to use or doesn't have the right storage facilities for it, et cetera. Um, knowledge transfer, so people like me in academia um, need to get out more and explain how this works, right? If you go to your normal mom and pop concrete facility and you say, I want green concrete, they're going to look at you crossways because they don't understand what green concrete is. They might just give you concrete that's dyed green, right? So you need to use the right terminology and talk to them um, in the right way. Space and capital, this is something really important, especially in places um, like New York City. Uh, New York City concrete plant is very, very tiny. They only have space for a couple of silos of material. So if you're trying to introduce a new material, they now need more space, they need more silos, they need the ability to, to, to do that. Um, and so they don't always have that capability to introduce novel materials. And finally, liability, risk. People are always worried about whether the concrete will be strong enough, whether it will last, um, and all of those issues. And we've really researched most of these materials, but getting that information out to the public appropriately and making the owners comfortable with that is important. And the solution to this often comes through political will and policy development, making sure that uh, the policymakers are willing to sort of address these four other barriers. So there's been a lot of movement in various municipalities and states and counties on trying to improve sustainable concrete. These have ranged from the uh, very small and targeted or uh, resolutions to sort of broader 
demands that you can only use concrete with this level of global warming potential, et cetera. Uh, but today I want um, you to listen to Mayor Armacost, who's going to talk about the work and the policy that they put forth in Hastings on Hudson, which um, really helped them to move forward with all of this. Thank you, Matt, and thank you to, uh, to, to the organizers for having me and also for giving me an opportunity to meet Matt in person because we've been doing everything virtually, so this is my first time meeting you and it's beyond thrilling to, to actually have a real human being uh, there to chat to. So um, just a little tiny bit about Hastings on Hudson. We are a small municipality, two miles square, 8,500 people on the banks of the Hudson River, charming. It uh, sounds like an English village. It sort of looks like an English village, which is a little bit why I was attracted there. Um, and we are just across the county from uh, White Plains, my, my friend Mayor Roach. Uh, so we're within lunching distance, as he, as he mentioned earlier. So we are small, but we're fierce. And we are fierce about climate-related issues. And I became mayor in 2019 and decided that if I was going to be mayor and if I was going to have to deal with the trolls and you know, all the complicated things that you have to deal with, with as a mayor, and this was before we even knew about COVID, I was going to be able to give my energy to something I was passionate about. And addressing climate change is one of those issues. So, uh, so, so we, we, did, we did many, many different things um, in that area. And one of the things that came up through a colleague that I'd known for many years was this idea of, of, um, of, of creating a resolution that would um, somehow address this issue of low embodied carbon concrete. And I was a little bit familiar with the idea because I'd been to a Bloomberg New Energy Finance event where Carbon Cure had spoken. I thought, that's a really interesting idea. And then this friend came and said, you know what, I'm, he was living in Costa Rica because we were all, all, of the, all over the world. And he said, I'm doing this thing with New York. We're really trying to get this thing moving in New York. You know, are you interested in any way? And I said, yeah, absolutely. We'll, we'll look at, at uh, creating a resolution here in Hastings. No one had done it on the East Coast. So the first thing that I wanted to know, because I knew I was going to have to persuade all the other stakeholders, you know, what's the rationale? I think you heard all of the environmental type reasons from Matt. But there was another thing that was important for us, which was we knew we were about to invest about $5 million in sidewalks. And so, you know, this was really an opportune moment for us. So there was this sidewalk project going. Um, Matt and Chris had persuaded me there wasn't going to be a, a massive cost difference at the end of the day. So, you know, we had a set of reasons to, to move forward. And they were very helpful. There's a group called the Open Air Collective that they are part of that had pulled together all of these resolutions from other places. And if any of you are in the business of creating resolutions, what you know, you know, it's a very cannibalistic activity. You know, you take a bit from here and a bit from there, and you kind of put together a resolution that works for your municipality. And so we took what we thought was the best from others who are leaders, mostly on the on the, uh, the West Coast and Hawaii, of course, is always very progressive on this stuff. And we started to craft something that we thought was special for Hastings. And so one of the things that we did, you, you know, resolutions are filled with whereas statements, whereas this, whereas that, whereas the other. So the part that I thought was really interesting that was different than some of the others, a couple of things. One was we identified the different ways in which something could be green concrete. So from using less cement to replacing or substituting cement with other types of material like fly ash or slag, using locally produced cement like ground glass pozzolan, which has only just become uh, part of the New York State specs, which is very exciting, but at that time hadn't. And then um, using uh, 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 the mineralization of carbon, which was this, the carbon cure type idea. So we, we put that range of, of ways of doing it inside the resolution. Um, and the other thing that we did, which I think is 
pretty unique is that we charged ourselves with proselytizing about it. So inside the resolution, you're welcome to have a look afterwards, it says that what we would do is go and chit chat with lots of other municipalities. When you're having lunch with Mayor Roach, make a point of telling him he's got a lot more sidewalks than you. You know, he should be doing this with his sidewalks not to mention Mayor Sparrow next door in, in uh, New York. And perhaps if you get invited to visit Mayor Adams, you know, you can, you can, in, you can sort of in New York City versus, versus Yonkers. So we had all of those elements that were there. Um, and, and then what we had to do was really create an education campaign. So we, we set up a website, all the materials available. We did webinars, gave speeches, we spoke to the media. And, and that, was, that was an education not only of the trustees, my fellow decision makers, also the building inspector was key, um, the contractors that are local, the architects that are local, our village engineer. Some of these stakeholders were the people who could really say, you know, this is not happening. So you have to kind of be, you have to be persuasive, you have to be a little bit charming perhaps, you have to be, you know, you have to add in all of this information that's going to persuade them that this is actually something that's cool, that's innovative, and actually isn't going to cost them anything. It's not going to, as, as Matt said, it's not risky. Um, the process of going from this, this first idea to actually adopting it took only about three months. So for those of you who are involved in, in municipal um, decision making, you know, that's like flying Concord on, on going from an idea to, to actually delivering a resolution. So it was pretty exciting. Um, and what we did was we, we, we started with a pilot project which, um, which was a wall that had been crashed into by a truck. You'll be happy to hear no one was hurt. It looked pretty ghastly when you, when you saw the truck fallen over. But it, it had to be put together with concrete. So what we did was we, we tested this, and we tested whether our way of persuading our engineer and the contractor and you know, et cetera, et cetera, was working on this project. It's, it's Cliff Street, so it was li there's literally a cliff that the truck went over, and you can see the wall looks very lovely. It was crafted by um, these fantastic workmen. We, we then did a second, um, a second retaining wall in a very darling pocket park um, uh, in the village, and then we persuaded the school. They were investing $20 million in an extension of the elementary school. We persuaded them to throw a, a, a green concrete LE, you know, LEC um, into their RFP. It ended up being built now over two years using low embodied carbon concrete. And our current and most exciting is to, is to, is to actually replace all of the sidewalks in the downtown, downtown with low embodied carbon concrete sidewalks using really investing $5 million in this. So, so it started with this little tiny pilot project, and we kind of spread the word. We got everyone on board, you know, and now we're, now we're, we're going to kind of radically transform our downtown. And by the way, it is white. It's not green. Lots of people ask me, is it green? And Matt, Matt of course, is very cheeky and naughty by throwing in a picture of green concrete. But actually, that isn't the color. Um, uh, and so there are a couple of success factors. We, were, we, didn't, we didn't specify the type of technology. You could see it could be all sorts of different kinds of things. Um, we, the leadership was involved. I was very involved. The other trustees were very involved. We have a trustee who's an architect who, um, who was able to explain to other architects, to builders, to contractors, using their language, why this was something important. We, we had a pilot project, and I should have mentioned um, the, 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 the cliff project was covered by insurance. So that was, that was someone else de-risked it. The insurance company de-risked that by covering the cost. And the, grant, uh, the sidewalk projects were all covered by grants. So it was actually not that risky for us to, to try these experiments. Um, and we did spend a lot of time with the collaboration of the Open Air Collective in gathering knowledge, packaging knowledge, making it um, interesting uh, and kind of accessible to people. 
And we, we made this commitment to educate others. And I've spent a lot of time talking to fellow mayors um, locally, uh, uh, up and down the river towns, and actually throughout the state about this, and why it's important for the big guys to be doing that, not just the tiny municipalities like ours. So I just want to end by saying, in addition to being obsessed with concrete, which I can probably only admit to a group like all of you, um, I'm also obsessed with the climate smart communities uh, and clean energy community programs. They're really excellent programs. And this activity got us innovation points under that program. And it helped us to uh, become, we're actually the, the highest ranked both climate smart community and clean energy community in, in New York State, which we're very proud of. It's fantastic for all of the rest of you to be involved in this. I've told Mayor Roach he has to give us a run for our money um, uh, and, and sort of move, move up the process with us. But uh, encourage all of you to become more informed and to start building your projects everywhere on this topic. Thank you. It's a great slide to have up here. Thank you so much, Mayor and Matt. And uh, unfortunately, because we're going long here, um, we can have only one question, but there must be a question out there. Yes, Mayor. So when you put it out for our opinion, like, how, do you get fewer bidders, or do you, do you see, like, what difference do you see in the cost for the materials? There was. Am I? Can you hear me? Yeah. There was, there was actually almost no difference. So the first projects that we did were a slag substitute. So there was a very, very tiny difference in cost. And um, the bidders, what they would do is ask us what we meant. And what we would do is get our engineer to have the conversation. So we would, um, and now it's, now it's part of New York State spec. So it's it's avail at that time when we did those projects, it wasn't part of the spec. So um, it's, it's an education, but they will, it didn't stop uh, people bidding. We ended up getting you know, an appropriate number of bids. Otherwise, it would have been very difficult for us to move forward with the projects. And the other thing that was great is that the, the money that came to us for the sidewalk projects were through CDBG grants, and the county um, administered those, and the person at the county became a convert. So, you know, we're gradually, we're proselytizing and creating converts all over the place. And, you know, when you have people in those positions who get it, it makes it much, much easier. I'll, I'll also just add that these, these materials have been, most of them, ground glass puzzle is new, but most of them have been used for a long time in concrete already, mm -hmm. um, but generally on higher profile projects because they help concrete lasts longer, actually. So, you know, they're going into projects that are, have 100-year lifespans um, and not generally in your uh, everyday concrete mom and pop stuff, but n now, you know, using it as a environmental su supplement, you know, it, it's, it's, they're getting a new life as well. Yeah, and to be clear, it's going from, say, 20% slag to 40% slag, right? So if it's a bridge, everyone might freak out, but if it's a sidewalk, it's just, you know, holding us. We're relatively reasonable weights to have on a sidewalk, most of us. Uh, so, if that makes sense. Yeah, I had a quick question. How much has any of this been used in like road construction and highway construction? You know, one of my nine thousand jobs is to is to be a throughway board member. So, I, given that the. Um, you know, the governor has added to this. I mean, have, do we have any examples of highway projects? Oh, I, I mean, absolutely, across, across the country. And in the Northeast, we tend to be more of an asphalt road area. Um, but, you know, if you go to Texas or the northern mid, Midwest or the northern Plain states, there's lots of concrete roads that have used these materials. Uh, but most of these materials, uh, fly ash, slag, uh, are already in the state DOT specs, particularly for things like bridge construction and bridge decks. Um, so, so the DOTs are familiar with them, just not necessarily using them to reduce embodied carbon uh, for that purpose. Yeah, 
there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, work, and and I, I, you know the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is a major leader in this area as well, and their specs um, and their new specs that recently came out are um, you know very good examples of of what to do. 